Okay, questions about T cells? Okay, now I'm going to do this hypersensitivity reaction. Um, really, I'm not going to ask any questions about it. Okay, I just want you to be alert to it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. There's four different types. The only thing I want you to know about hypersensitivity reactions is what it is. It just means that your immune system is hypersensitive. And these are where all the, this explains things about allergies, right? Poison ivy and stuff. And there's four different types of hypersensitivity reactions, okay? Um, it's when your immune gets excessive. And it probably has something to do with the suppressor T cells not doing their job properly, okay? So it produces damaging, sometimes fatal reactions. And you've heard of all these in the news if you haven't heard from your own friends and family, right? Peanut allergy, you can't breathe, okay? So um, <coughs> there's four different types. And I'm really not gonna spend time talking about them. Uh, just understand the concept. When you get further into your medical uh, field, you'll learn more about them. Uh, but I put this, put this up here because it fits into the immune system, and I just want to make sure that I'm complete with that in here. So there's four different types, type, and we call it type 1 hypersensitivity, type 2 hypersensitivity, and so forth, and how they're actually mediated on each one of these things. So the first one over here um, is going to be, come on, type 1 reaction uh, or type 1 hypersensitivity and these are the things where we just talked about allergies to pollen, bee stings, um, giving you these hives um, and eczema. Okay? Um, it's an acute reaction that happens over here. Uh, it releases uh, the IgE uh, is attached to basophils and they, get, they release the histamine. And histamine, as you know, is going to do vasodilation, and it's going to close. It's going to vasodilate your blood vessels, but it's going to bronchoconstrict your breathing. So these are the people that can't breathe, okay? And we call this an anaphylactic shock or anaphylaxis. These are the ones that are serious that they can't breathe. So what they usually would do for something like this, and I think I mentioned it, is that we're going to give a, um, uh, a epinephrine. And we've learned about epinephrine, what that does. It's going to basically constrict your blood vessels, but it's going to open up the, uh, the airway, the bronchial, okay, bronchial. All right, so just examples. You've got the wheel and flare, or flare and wheel. You've heard those things before. That's basically how a mosquito bite happens. When you get bit by a mosquito, um, it gets erythematous at the area over there. Um, so that's the flare part, and it's going to cause inflammation, but localized inflammation so that it inflames, it gets bigger, it swells. We call that a wheel, okay? It gets to be there. All right, so that's a type one reaction and just showing you how it actually works over here. Uh, type two hypersensitivity reaction uh, is more of the blood transfusions that we spoke about before. Uh, also the autoimmune diseases and transplant re rejection um, also occurs over here. And it's basically your body uh, fighting against something that's foreign. All right, and it's a cytotoxic reaction, Rx and its reaction, cytotoxic. So this is where IgG or IgM is going to bind to these um, antigens, and it's going to phagocyte proteins and destroy things that way. Um, an example of this is Graves' disease, which is an autoimmune disease, and we talked about that with energy materials. Okay, um, so it's just showing you here where it's going to be the severity of cells. All right, okay, so I was expecting. Then you got a type three hypersensitivity reaction. This is where we have these complexes, the antigen antibody complexes, uh, that it gets it, it forms too many of them and gets deposited in areas you don't want. Um, there's just too many of these complexes. Why it happens, we don't know. Again, it's hypersensitive. Yes, the antigen and antibody should bind with each other, but we should have all of that going on. Um, and this is how you would explain rheumatoid arthritis because some of these antigen and antibody complexes get deposited in the joint. And it gets so much in there, it's difficult to actually move the joints. That's how that is, is explained on there. Uh, and lupus does the same way uh, in this case too. Um, so uh, this is just some immune complex reactions. Again, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but if you had an interest, you could read about it over here. Um, and an example again is where the systemic lupus is 
empirical mitosis, that, that the gene lupus uh, affects inside the cell um, and actually binds to the histone in the DNA. And that's what's happening over there. And it causes a multiple different things that we talked about before. All right, so it's just showing here we have the antibody antigen complex that just builds up so much and it clogs up certain things. In, in, the, um, uh, in lupus, it usually clogs up the kidneys. Have renal failure because of that. And then the type 4 reaction is a delayed reaction, all right, because of delayed hypersensitivity. And you probably experienced this sometime in your life uh, or somebody in your family. And this is where we'd explain the poison ivy, the poison sumac, or the poison oak reaction. Notice that when you, if, if you've had this before, if you notice someone had this, um, they're working in the woods and then that night, nothing. The following night, nothing. And then the following night after that, like all of a sudden you see this, this rash over here. It's delayed. It took about one to two days for you to get a reaction. Does that make sense? Um, and that's where that comes in. We also see this delayed reaction in PPD, which we'll talk about with tuberculosis. To get tested to see if you've been exposed to TB or tuberculosis, they do something called a PPD test. Who here has heard of a PPD test? Who here has had a PPD? Right? If you remember, if you had the PPD test, they injected it in a subcutaneously, just underneath the skin, not in the muscle, uh, a little bit, we'll talk about this when we get to TB, they put a little bit of this uh, reagent in that area, and then they ask you to come back two days later. Because that's when, if there's going to be a reaction, that's when the reaction is going to occur. It's not right afterwards, there's a delay there, okay? And that's what happens with that. Um, and it's cell-mediated. Um, like I said, it gets that one to three days later reaction, it's called a delayed reaction. All right, and poison ivy is a good example of this. Um, and also, just uh, since we're on the subject of poison ivy, if you don't know much about it, um, the poison ivy produces this oil on the leaf itself. This oil is called, um, I can't pronounce it, urushol. urushol. That's what's contagious. So. Just finding out that you were exposed to um, poison ivy, let's say, that day, and then you took a shower and you didn't realize it until the following day, whatever is done is done because the shower took off all the oil. Does, does that make sense? It's not the leaf itself, it's the oil, this urushol, and that's what actually makes you uh, build a reaction to it. So they do sell this stuff at CVS and Rite Aid and Walgreens. Um, I forgot what it's called, but um, it's stuff that you can put on your skin just after touching poison ivy and allows you to get that oil off. Once the oil sits there for a number of hours, it's already inside your skin. You want to be able to get that off as much as, as fast as possible. It's the oil that actually causes you to have this uh, reaction. Okay? Um, so what happens there? So it's a delayed. All right, so basically this is the end of uh, immunology. It's a long um, journey through what we've been going through. I know it's a different way of studying, different way of learning. It's, uh, immunology is kind of different than the rest of anatomy and physiology. But we can't finish or we can't even, uh, you know, like complete the immunology without talking about AIDS uh, and HIV. Right? Cause that's what really was the major impact with uh, immunology in general with education and not just, you know, at the college level, but also at the, um, you know, research level. Uh, as I said before, if I was going to teach immunology back in, let's say, 1975, believe me, we blink of the eye, we just know, we only know surfaces <laughs> of, about the immune system. But once HIV um, made the headlines and stuff and uh, we saw the epidemics, mm, Early 1980s, maybe 82, 81, 83, um, that's when we started learning a lot. We didn't know what was going on, what is a helper T cell, that, all that stuff. That's where all this came about. So if there's anything good that came out of HIV, it's that we learned a lot more about the immune system than ever before, and now they got whole courses on just immune, on immunology. So we, uh, you know, what was once an itch is now an allergy. Just things that were always there, we didn't understand it. So, and all of these, I know all of these have heard about HIV and AIDS, and uh, I just want to show you what's been going on, what's, what's changing that's going on. 
So HIV, the human uh, immunodeficiency virus, okay, uh, it's transmitted by uh, bodily fluids, okay. Um, the way the, the mechanism works is this, and I don't want to make light of what HIV is, but for me to teach it, I think it, it's a little bit easier if we talk about uh, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. You'll, you'll understand what I mean. Basically what happens here is that HIV attacks the T4 cell, the helper T cell. And like I said, the helper T cell is a major component of the whole immune system. Um, if you do that whole thing, this back to that scenario where you got the picket fence, someone breaks through that, you got Fido, the dog starts barking, if it breaks through that, then the master comes out and says, Fido, you know, the dog's barking, continue barking, it's a burglar, I'm going to call 911. Okay? That's the immune system, that's the, um, uh, the acquired immune system, the master. He's going to pick up the phone and he's going to call up 911 and the dispatcher will receive the phone call. That's the helper T cell. So what HIV is doing is destroying the dispatcher. So you, in other words, you're calling up and it's ringing, it's ringing, it's ringing, you're not going to get any help. So the burglar or the crime person is going to do stuff to your house and do other things. It's just going to keep on going. Does that make sense? So destroying helpers, the helper T cell is a very smart way that the HIV actually destroys the body. Okay, but this is what's really um, why the HIV virus is so smart. If this is a helper T cell, and I'm just going to draw a picture of a virus, just a turn milk kind of virus. All right, and it injects its DNA. into the host cell, into the helper T cell. The helper T cell is then going to make, because you're incorporating the DNA um, or the RNA into your uh, the host cell, the host cell is going to make more viruses because it doesn't know what to do. How I kind of showed you that if I had to make a thousand copies of your exams and someone, I don't know who, put a picture of, um, uh, I don't know, uh, a picture of a lighthouse in there. I don't know what that means, but a picture of a lighthouse in in my pit, in my uh, stack of uh, exams. Now I didn't see that, but it kind of snuck it in there. Now I'm going to make tons of uh, like a thousand copies of that exam with the incorporation of a lighthouse or maybe an advertisement to a party. I didn't see that in there, but they're using my power to make more of that. Does that make sense? That's what's happening. It's incorporating its DNA into the host DNA and the host or the helper T cell is then going to spit out more of these viruses. Okay? Now here's where HIV gets smart. Okay, so it has these Viruses and all these viruses can then go to other helper T cells and destroy them. Okay, because after this, it destroys the helper T cell. Just after they come out, this whole thing gets destroyed. Now, this is what happens here this virus, HIV virus, inside is HIV, on the outside, it has different antigens. In other words, this one may look like Mickey Mouse. goes inside here, so if we see Mickey Mouse, we know we should destroy those viruses because so, they're incorporating its DNA into ours. Problem is, when it comes in here, it kind of tells itself to make these viruses or make them look like Donald Duck. I don't know how to spell Donald Duck, but you get the picture. You see the difference? It mutates. The virus mutates, even though it's the same. It's like putting a, a, you know, if I see, if I go through my test, I'll use that same scenario. Someone put an advertisement or a lighthouse picture, whatever, in there, and it was like a, a, a black page. I could look through there and say, oh, the black page, I can take that out. But next time around, they're actually putting in a red page. Now, I wouldn't know that a red page is something bad. 
but they change it. If I tell uh, my uh, assistant to say, hey, look, just keep an eye on there. I expect no black pages in there. So they're just looking for black pages. Meanwhile, someone put a red page in there. So they don't know that that's a bad thing or not. You see what I'm saying? Because maybe myself, I just said black pages are bad. But maybe she says, well, he's too busy to do anything else. He put a red page in there. It must be something he wants. You see what I'm saying? No, no, I don't want black pages or red pages. But now someone puts in a green page. You see what I'm saying? It keeps mutating. This, this virus keeps mutating. So that's why, and this is the key thing here, that's why I feel, and many people feel, there isn't going to be a vaccine for this. Because it keeps mutating. We can't recognize on the outside what it is. The antigen keeps changing. Does that make sense? Okay? So that's what this is all about. It's, it's smart. And then afterwards, when this comes out, this cell opens up and like basically bursts. So that's what's happening here is that the HIV uses the helper T cells to make more viruses. Meanwhile, it's going to destroy the helper T cell. Not a good thing. Okay? Targeting HIV replication. The replication of HIV-1 is a multi-stage process. Each step is crucial to successful replication and is therefore a potential target of antiretroviral drugs. Step 1 is the infection of a suitable host cell, such as a CD4 positive T lymphocyte. Entry of HIV into the cell requires the presence of certain receptors on the cell surface. CD4 receptors and co-receptors such as CCR5 or CXCR4. These receptors interact with protein complexes which are embedded in the viral envelope. These complexes are composed of two glycoproteins, an extracellular GP120 and a transmembrane GP41. When HIV approaches a target cell, GP120 binds to the CD4 receptors. This process is termed attachment. It promotes further binding to a co-receptor. Co-receptor binding results in a conformational change in GP120. This allows GP41 to unfold and insert its hydrophobic terminus into the cell membrane. GP41 then folds back on itself. This draws the virus towards the cell and facilitates the fusion of their membranes. The viral nucleocapsid enters the host cell and breaks open, releasing two viral RNA strands and three essential replication enzymes. Integrase, protease, and reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase begins the reverse transcription of viral RNA. It has two catalytic domains, the ribonuclease H active site and the polymerase active site. Here, single-stranded viral RNA is transcribed into an RNA-DNA double helix. Ribonuclease H breaks down the RNA. The polymerase then completes the remaining DNA strand to form a DNA double helix. Now, integrase goes into action. It cleaves a dinucleotide from each three prime end of the DNA, creating two sticky ends. Integrase then transfers the DNA into the cell nucleus and facilitates its integration into the host cell genome. The host cell genome now contains the genetic information of HIV. Activation of the cell induces transcription of proviral DNA into messenger RNA. The viral messenger RNA migrates into the cytoplasm, where building blocks for a new virus are synthesized. Some of them have to be processed by the viral protease. Protease cleaves longer proteins into smaller core proteins. This step is crucial to create an infectious virus. 
two viral RNA strands and the replication enzymes then come together and core proteins assemble around them, forming the capsid. This immature viral particle leaves the cell, acquiring a new envelope of host and viral proteins. The virus matures and becomes ready to infect other cells. HIV replicates billions of times per day, destroying the host's immune cells and eventually causing disease progression. Drugs which interfere with the key steps of viral replication can stop this fatal process. Entry into the host cell can be blocked by fusion inhibitors, for example. Inhibition of reverse transcriptase by nucleoside inhibitors or by non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors is part of standard antiretroviral regimens. The action of integrase can be blocked. Protease inhibitors are also part of standard antiretroviral therapy. Each blocked step in viral replication is a step towards better control of HIV disease. So, as this happens, your immune system is going to go down because you don't have the dispatcher as much as you did before. Now, it happens very slowly at first, and symptoms may appear in a few months to 10 years later. It depends on the variation of this HIV. It also depends on that person's immune system to start off with, okay? Now, the way you can get HIV, let me, not the way, but let, let me ask you this, okay? I'm gonna give you a choice, and just listen to everything first, and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands. I want everybody to do this. Don't be embarrassed. Today, okay, what's the most common way or the most increasing people that are getting HIV? Okay? Worldwide. Right now. Let me give you the choices. Okay? Here are the choices. Don't answer yet, and then I'll go through it again. Is it Homosexuals, heterosexuals, drug-induced, right, like street drugs, using street drugs, uh, passing it from mom to baby, blood transfusions, okay? Those are probably the more common ones. So again, it's homosexuals, heterosexuals, um, uh, what did I say, um, drug uh, street drug usage, um, getting from mom to baby, and then blood transfusion. If you need a blood transfusion, it's, uh, it's contaminated. All right. So who here thinks blood transfusions is the most common way today people are getting? What about passing it from mom to baby through the placenta? Drug use, street drug use. Heterosexual contact, homosexual contact. Okay. Now, just seeing everyone's hands, you can see we're not at all agreeing with this. And yet, HIV is a pretty scary kind of disease out there and virus to, to be scared about. Because you can see people are not too sure about this. The answer is heterosexual contact is the most common way right now. Not saying it's not common at all with drug users, as most of you raised your hand for that too, but I'm just saying right now. Now, over the years, since 1980, things have changed, going up and down, up and down. But right now, heterosexual contact. Okay? You might want to know that one. All right? Hint, hint. So, again, we have sexual transmitter, transmission. Heterosexual contact, MCT, is the most common cause of HIV transmission, homosexuals also. It's found, the viruses are found in the <coughs> saliva, God bless you, okay? It's found in saliva 
but it's not transmissible. It's not the, the part that's going to actually get into the help, helper T cells is not. So kissing's okay. Homosexuals, the way that they were getting it, more men than women, is because they do a lot of anal sex. And what was happening is it was in the semen. And when they do the anal sex, there's a lot of fissures that go on, or a lot of cracks that go on with the anus. So now you've got bleeding areas here, you have semen that's going to go into the bloodstream, that's how it gets past it. Or the blood goes into, if there's a sore on the penis itself. Does that make sense? That's where the, the greatest uh, contact is. Okay. See, I could talk about this stuff because with my OBGYN. And you guys need to know about this stuff. Listen, the only way you can fight HIV, or most diseases of today, is education. If you think about it. Because once you got it, you got it. So you need to know how to prevent it and how to pass it on uh, the, the knowledge to your own children or nieces and nephews or just colleagues or friends. You've got to be open about this. And all of these are going into the health field. You should be very comfortable, if you can, to be speaking about this. All right? The only way to fight this is education. It's the only way. Okay? So we can do it this way. We can also pass it through parental. In other words, through the IV or through some kind of needle. So intravenous drug use, blood transfusions, even accidental needle sticks that if you're working into a hospital, you may get stuck with a needle. You may get stuck with a, with a scalpel if you're going to do help with surgery. And what it is is that one in 300 needle sticks, accidental needle sticks, has HIV in it. What does that mean? If you get stuck 300 times throughout your lifetime, one is going to be positive. Okay? That's about a point, I think it's, if I do my percentages right, it's 0.3%. Okay? Am I doing the math right? 0.3%? Okay. Um, perinatal, where it passes from mom to baby, that does happen. All right. Also, it does pass through the breast milk, too. Now, I'm a big fan of having breastfeeding go on because you've got formula. And how much is formula nowadays? Do you know? How much is it a month or how much is it a week? $20, $30? Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And breast milk, how much is that? Sure. Yeah, you see? Okay. Um, so there's that, plus you learned about the IgA, right? That goes, the, the uh, antibodies goes through there. You have the mother-baby uh, contact. Um, I know it's kind of difficult for some women to do that, um, but keep in mind, we've been doing it for eons, and that's why the breasts are there for the baby, right? Um, so there's uh, problems with latching and stuff. That's another talk for another time if you want to do that. But I'm just saying there's a lot of big uh, pros to be doing that. And, uh, but only the, the only thing that I would say definitely you can't breastfeed for is if mom has HIV, it will be passed to baby. All right? The other thing is if mom's a drug user, you don't want those drugs to go to baby. Those are really one or the two, or if the mother's getting some kind of chemotherapy, like there's certain kind of medications that do get passed to there too. But for the most part, breastfeeding, there's too many pros when you compare it to the cons. Okay? So anyway, that's what that is. All right, and like I said, breastfeeding. All right, um, <clears throat> that's our little culprit. That's what the HIV looks like. Okay, now the antigens you can't see; it's very microscopic, but those things would change on it. But that's our HIV virus. Okay, <clears throat> um, so HIV replication. I kind of explained that to you over here with a Mickey Mouse Donald Duck scenario, but that's written up here. Okay. And um, they use a, an enzyme called um, uh, reverse transcriptase. I'm not going to ask you about that. When you take microbiology, you learn more about this. But just keep in mind that the, there's a high mutation rate that goes on with this, going from Mickey Mouse to Donald Duck. And because of that, a cure is virtually going to be impossible unless they could find some way that they could resolve this or, or kill this area, you know what I'm saying, in terms of like, this, if they could catch on to how they can stop this from changing, yes, but it's going to be very difficult to find a cure for this. Mm -hmm. I don't remember like the details, but there was an article, I think like a year or two ago, 
when they were saying that Switzerland, right? Something like that. But they didn't cure HIV. They just like kind of deactivated all the virus cells in the body, so cured the symptoms, even though the HIV was still mm -hmm. in their body. We're getting better with medications. I'm going to talk about that too. We're getting better with medications, but we have people living with HIV for like 25, 30 years. Beginning in the 80s, we see a lot of people dying. You've seen all the, if you were living then, you learned all this about the celebrities that were dying of HIV and AIDS. Uh, Freddie, Freddie Mercury from uh, the group of uh, Queen, the Liberace, the piano player, Rock Hudson was a big one, was a movie star. Um, and they were just dying very fast. But now with the new medications that are out, um, there's no cure for it, but what they're doing is they're extending life. Um, but you could imagine that even with HIV, you're going to have um, some issues with relationships, you know, and, and talking about that. It's, a, it's a definitely a social, um, a social issue that you've got to deal with with that, and uh, it just becomes a part of your life. If you're born with it because mom gave it, gave it to the, the baby, that's the only life they know. So um, there's some issues there. But research has getting better and better and better, but the problem they have is this thing where it keeps on mutating about this. All right? Um, <coughs> so what is AIDS? HIV is the virus. AIDS is what it actually would cause. So this is called uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. If you destroy the T4 cells, the helper T cells, your immune system is going to go down. If your immune system is going to go down, you're going to be very, it's going to be very difficult for you to fight even the common cold, okay? So you would have someone that's immunocompromised, right? An immunocompromised patient is a patient where the immune system is compromised or declined. So do make sure you know the difference between immunocompromised versus immunocompetent, right? An easy, you know, easy mix-up between the two, but they're complete opposites. Someone who's immunocompromised, their immune system's down. Someone is immunocompetent, I would hope everybody in this room is immunocompetent, that their immune system is way up to par. Okay? So, like I said, they can die from chicken pox or just the common cold, depending on how much of the numbers of the helper T cells have gone down. So, AIDS develops slowly. You got phase one. And what happens here, it may last a few weeks to a few years. It's different for each person in the variant of the HIV. It may start off as a brief period of just flu-like vague symptoms. All right? Swollen lymph nodes, chills, fevers, fatigue, uh, body ache. Um, it's almost like you're taking A and P, and that's how you're feeling, right? It's that vague kind of thing that's happening. And most people don't exhibit recognizable symptoms. They don't realize that that's what's, what's happening with them. They've got a runny nose or something like that. But in the meantime, the virus is multiplying. Okay? Um, and antibodies are made but are ineffective uh, for the complete virus re removal. It's just because it keeps changing. So they make an antibody for this, and now we've got to make an antibody for this. Another antibody that makes it look like Pluto and Goofy and so forth. So your body's always making antibodies for something that won't exist anymore because it, it, the virus keeps on mutating, okay? Then we have phase two. And phase two is the thing where opportunistic infections are starting to happen. This occurs during between six months to 10 years. You have bacteria all over your body. If you don't think that you have bacteria on your skin, even when you wash your hands, you're fooling yourself. You are loaded with bacteria. There's bacteria in your mouth, in the vagina, on your hand, all over the place, in your intestines, everywhere, okay? But we have good bacteria and we have bad bacteria that's in there. What's nice is that the good bacteria is keeping down the bad bacteria. But if the good bacteria start flourishing, or not flourishing, but start diminishing, then the bad bacteria is going to get higher and higher and it's going to cause some disease in your body. This is, so this bad bacteria has the opportunity to cause mayhem in your body. So we call these opportunistic infections. So it's normal flora, it's normal bacteria that's in your body, but that's okay because the good bacteria is keeping it down. But if the good bacteria goes down, then the numbers of these bad bacteria are going to flourish 
and they're going to set some things, you know, cause the diseases. Okay? Um, if you leave it untreated, 95% will progress to the next phase, which is called AIDS. Okay? This is where we got phase three. This is clinical AIDS. The helper T cell numbers have got down to less than 200 um, cells per millimeter uh, cube, uh, cube. Okay? It's very, very low. All right? It's less than that. The opportunistic infections and cancers are going to start getting higher and higher and higher. That's why when we see people with tuberculosis, one of our biggest concerns is that their immune system has gone down. Could be because of cortical steroids, could be that they're just getting older, because as we get older, our immune system goes down, like 85 years old. Or someone who's 30 years old, where their immune system should be up, our other concern is that, is there HIV in here? Pneumonias, meningitis, all right, encephalitis, which is an uh, uh, infection of the brain, uh, Carposi sarcoma. Have you ever seen that movie with Tom Hanks, uh, Philadelphia? I think it's called Philadelphia, where he plays a, an HIV uh, uh, patient. He had all these big black marks that were happening on his skin, and they would disappear and come back in a different area. Those were Carposi sarcoma, which is basically a cancer all right, sarcoma is a cancer of blood vessels. And they would come up, and they'd start invading, and then disappear, and then they would appear someplace else. It's got a weird feature like that. And that's Car Carposi sarcoma. You never see that. I've, I've only heard about that when your immune system is extremely low. So I wouldn't say Carposi sarcoma is synonymous, synonymous with someone who's got HIV, but it's right there. All right, because it's got to have your eight year helper T cells have got to be very low. Okay, and if left untreated for this phase three, it's usually fatal. Okay, so what's happening here over the years? Okay, so this is years after infection. This is uh, helper T cell in the body. All right, you can see here that this is T cells, the orange here, the T cells are going down. HIV in the blood would then go up because the helper T cell, think about it, the, if, if your viruses in the blood are going to destroy all your helper T cells, the, it, it, they're indirectly proportional, right? The numbers of viruses go up, your helper T cells will go down. Does that make sense? Okay. And the antibodies, just because your immune system, you make a lot of them because you have all this um, you have all these viruses in it's going to go up, but then it'll also go down too, because your immune system is just going to go down. Remember, keep in mind, what's going to activate, this is going back to what we've been talking about, what activates B cells to make antibodies? Interleukin-2, which comes from helper T cells. So if you don't have helper T cells, you're not going to make interleukin-2, which means it's not going to make B cells to turn into plasma cells to make antibodies. It's all put together, okay? <coughs> so treatments, and like I said, newer medications are coming out. There's not a 100% cure, but they are making people live a lot longer like this. Um, as long as the patients are taking their medications. And you're going to see, getting to the medical field, that there's a lot of people out there that are just non-compliant. They don't want to take their medications. Either it's too much money, which we have to have our government t step in here and make sure that the medi you know, medications are given to them, or they're, you know, they just don't like the side effects of certain things. Okay? Um, so we have patient compliance that's going on here, uh, and making sure that they do go to the doctor to get the prescriptions for these medications. All right? Now we got this whole Obamacare thing. Now everybody's covered. They should be seeing the doctor. But a lot of times, even my father, he not that he has HIV, but he knew there was something wrong with his foot. He's a diabetic. It turned into this black, mummified toe. He knew something was wrong. He waited a long time before he saw the doctor. You see what I mean? We see a lot of people, more, much more than what you're, you, you think about. Okay? It's just that, you know, you have, I guess the most common reason is either uh, I have no time to see the doctor, or it's not bad, I'll just uh, go on like, like this. Does that make sense? So as long as they get the medications and they take the medications, then you know the treatments are pretty good. They last, you know, at least we have people living it for like 25, 30 years. So 
there is no cure to it. So this is where if you're going into the medical field, you've got to push the compliancy of the patient to do this. Okay? Um, so preventative spread is really the only way we can actually, uh, the only way we can do this is education, right? Condoms and things, uh, and, and just educating um, that these are the ways that you can get this. All right, breastfeeding and, and sex and things like that. So education is the only preventative measure that we can do. Because like I said, once you have it, that's it. You can't get it back. You can't try and stop it. It's just there, okay? So that's why I always say start uh, educating your friends and family and, and even strangers, if you, you know. Like, technically, you're strangers to me. So I'm spreading the word, you know what I'm saying? So that we can just give it, you know, and just make it extend further and further, okay? So, and you can see here, um, deaths were very high up until mid-90s, and then it's been coming down. Because of the newer medications, we have people here living with AIDS, it's much higher here in 2009, and it's even going higher now. But they have it, you can't get rid of it, okay? Alright, so that's what I want to say about HIV. Questions about HIV? Anything. Like I said, you're going to learn more about this when you get into microbiology. You'll be spending probably a whole chapter on this type of stuff. But I want to introduce you to it um, and emphasize the importance of helper T cells. Now on this, there isn't much I'm going to do on here. Just an integrated summary of the immune responses overall. Um, and just watch all the videos that I put on, on, the, uh, uh, on YouTube. But this, again, just to put it all together, I showed this slide before, but I, I think it's an important one. Here you've got a macrophage that's going to see a bacteria up there. It's going to engulf that bacteria, break it all up, and dispose of the debris there. But it's going to have a little piece of it sticking out here to present it because this macrophage is part of the innate or the non-specific <coughs> immune system. But it needs to present it to the acquired immune system. So in a case like this, it's going to present it to a B cell. The B cell is going to see that, get activated, and then it's going to turn it into a plasma cell. And from that plasma cell, it's going to make antibodies. We all know what antibodies do. They'll also um, tell the B cell to make more B cells and make more memory B cells. So should that ever see that antigen ever again, it knows exactly what to make and how much to make to beat it, okay? So that's uh, the humoral immunity. The cellular immunity, similar but different. Again, a macrophage over here is going to destroy that or destroy that bacteria. It's then going to put a piece of it out here so that the T cell over here, that killer T cell, sees it, and it's going to, um, yeah, it's going to present it to that so that the killer T cell can do its thing, right? So the T cell can become, not the killer T cell, but a T cell can become a killer T cell, a helper T cell, a suppressor T cell, or a memory T cell. So it's all together over here, okay? This over here kind of puts this all together again. You have an antigen that enters your body up here. Non-specific defenses happen. Non-specific things, right? We're going to have macrophages doing their things. We're going to have the complement system, inflammation. All that non-specific stuff is going to happen. And, uh, natural killer cells, complement system. But then this is going to talk to the acquired immune system by doing that antigen presenting uh, part over there. Now the acquired immune system has those two branches. We're either going to activate B cells, which is going to make antibodies, and those antibodies will then come back up here so that we can recognize that antigen for future references. Or we can, all, or and we can also make uh, cytotoxic T cells, the killer T cells, and that's going to destroy whatever that virus is uh, infecting. All right. Uh, you can do over here. Don't be facing follows. Here's one for bacteria, and this is what happens with viruses.
Okay? All done with immunology. Fun, fun, fun. But I did, we spent about a week and a half on this um, because it tends to be a little bit tougher than usual.